Welcome back to God's Business. I'm your host, Nicholas Bailey, where I interview the top Christian influencers, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders on how you can create not just a good business, but God's business where he is the multiplier of your success. Whether you're listening or watching right now, what you're going to want to do if you are a man in business that wants to grow in his relationship with Christ and build his business as well, financial legacy, etc. We actually have a group on Facebook called The King's Brotherhood. You can keep this going. Head over to Facebook, open your phone, Type in the app, The King's Brotherhood, and go ahead and request to join that group. Absolutely phenomenal, timeless. We have over 5,700 other guys that are Christian men that own businesses that are over in that. Or, hey, send it to someone that you know. You've been listening for a while. Go send it to the man that should be in a group like that. That may be seeing things on social media that they shouldn't be looking at, and they can fill their entire news feed with stuff that's actually going to help them grow, transform their life, and transform their business as well as their family. I have a phenomenal guest here today that I brought in. You're going to want to watch the very end of this video or listen to the very end of this audio because this guy is not only a rodeo world champion, he grew up on a hardcore ranch and has built multiple businesses inside of his life, but also inside of his professional career, has a phenomenal family and an absolutely insane story. I've been able to see him speak in front of 4,000 plus people on stage. I've also had conversations with him even in the hallways. And all I know is he's an absolute stand-up guy that talks about masculinity. He also talks about America and shows the blend of those two things in business and in hard work. Please welcome my friend Tyson Durfee. Tyson, appreciate you being on the God's Business Show. I am so excited. Let's do this. Yeah, man. I, I, For people that are watching the video version, you'll see pink shirt, which is textbook. This is your like Tiger Woods red or Ricky Fowler orange. I'm trying to think of other sports where people wear a specific color at a specific time, but that's yeah. kind of been a signature of yours. Cowboy hat. I love this because one, I feel that people, you were talking about a prop check that you have coming up, but like people are wanting to understand not only they want to be American again, I feel like, like yeah. it's the, the crazy non-american people are making people want to be more american but at the same time they're like well what does it mean to be an american like i don't actually know what that even means or like what's the root or like how did we actually become something before it was like an identity where we're like oh i want to be like that now i'm going to listen to country music or i'm going to do yeah. this and so it's just very cool for me being a west coast kid and where were you born I was actually born in the Midwest, uh, St. Joe, Missouri. It's where the actual mail service in America started called the Pony Express. So um, I kind of come from a, I come from a weird background though, man. It's, it's, you know, my biggest influences as a young man were Biggie Smalls, Tupac. Uh, parents got divorced super young. I was raised in the inner city. Um, and when I got too wild and too out of control and running with the wrong group, my mom sent me to the farm to live with my dad. And that's where the country life kind of came in. And so I had this wow. mixed vision, a little bit of, you know, gangster rap was, was my biggest influence as a young man, MC Hammer. I had the mullet MC Hammer pants, you know, and I was a little bit wild and out of control. Uh, but then my mom sent me with my dad and he straightened me out and I've been a cowboy ever since. That's so wild. I mean, that's what, one, it's kind of a cool testament because that's a possibility for a lot of families out yeah. there. Yeah. They're always trying to think like, how do I create this rite of passage for my kid? At least the ones that are listening to a show like this are like, how do I raise my kids right? You know, the movie style would be like, send them to boarding school, you know, things like that. For you, you were, I'm assuming you said your parents are split up. So then your, um, your mom was probably working. And so you're just like off doing whatever you want, upset. Yep. And then yeah, it, was crazy. It, then it was crazy for me. My childhood just to give everybody a, you know, cause I think a lot of godly men can, can relate to this. Uh, my childhood was violence, arguing, fighting, uh, alcohol addictions, uh, you know, just walking on eggshells when you walk in the house. Cause you didn't know what side of dad you were going to get depending on if he was drinking or not drinking. Um, yep. and you know, anytime mom and dad were together, it was, you know, knock down, drag out fights, all of that stuff. And so, my mom moved when they got divorced to uh, Kansas City, and my dad lived in the country and was a horse trainer. And so um, by no means was it easy for me. I had two amazing parents that were struggling to make ends meet. Money was always a problem. When I lived with my mom, we'd go for weeks, literally weeks without food. 
uh, we would go for weeks without electricity and my mom would burn candles and say, honey, we're camping. Let's make fun, you know, uh, let's have fun with this. And I think there's a lot of folks out there that have really struggled with their, their family life. And, you know, they understand what it means to come from nothing. And um, I was pretty much that, but I had a torn identity. When I was a young man, I all I wanted to do was listen to gangster rap music, ride skateboards and steal stuff. I thought it was cool to cuss my teachers. I thought it was cool to, you know, disrespect the police or anything like that. Faith was not even in my repertoire at that point. Um, and as I got too wild and out of control for my mom to handle in every learning disability class, she sent me to my dad. And my dad sat me down one day. He says, son, you're going to do exactly what I say and you're going to get straight A's or there's going to be hell to pay. And I was like, yeah, dad, whatever, you know, typical headstrong. I know what's right. You don't know anything. And the, our deal was I had to be studying, uh, you know, for school, or I had to be working with my dad on the ranch. Now my dad worked every day from 6 a.m. to midnight on the ranch, on the farm riding horses, building fence, just ranch life. And, you know, very, very normal to have an 18 hour day. A, a short day would be a 14, 15 hour day. And so wow. one night I fell asleep studying social studies definitions and I wake up and my dad's got me by the throat and he is whipping me with the rope over and over and over and over again. And we call it in rodeo a pig and string, but it's basically like the size of an extension cord on a on a vacuum cleaner or something like that. And he whipped me so many times that I couldn't sit down without being in immense pain or lay on my back without being in immense pain. Anyway, every time he'd try to hit me, I would try to jump away. So I got whipped from my back all the way down to my butt, all the way down to my legs. And I remember going to bed that night crying, thinking like, what just happened to my whole world? Everything I thought was right now just got turned upside down. And a lot of people will say nowadays that's way over the line. And it is. It was way over the line. Um, but my dad put the fear of God in me that night. Now, at that time, my dad was I had to respect my dad like God. And I made an honest effort to go a complete different direction, 100 percent. And it shifted and changed my life. You know, like in your life, you have these opportunities and these points where it's like a complete different trajectory. Now, this night was that night for me. I had how, how long night. was that like from when you actually went to his farm? How long was it until you had that moment? Like, were you like was, kind of doing OK? And then all of a sudden, you sounds like you fell asleep too early and he came home and you weren't working or finish your school yeah. or something. And you just yeah, it was probably right. it was like 11 o'clock at night. My dad's whole thing was like we work hard physically all day, every day. Very little food. Uh, everybody on the ranch was super skinny. Um, and uh it was probably like 11 o'clock at night when I fell asleep. I remember just like nodding off. And the last definition I read was saga, long stories that the Vikings told about their great deeds because we were studying Vikings in like school. And I fell asleep and I just remember him wake and just knocking the crap out of me. But I'm actually thankful for it. I am yeah. actually thankful for that whipping. And it's the only time he ever did something like that to me. I'm thankful for it because it put me on a path of, of, of excellence. And in, in the beginning, it was out of fear. Like, I'm scared. Like, I literally, like, kids say, I think my dad's going to kill me. I thought my dad, like, literally would kill me, right? And so I was like, okay, he will, at best, knock the living daylights out of me. So I'm going to respect and, and fear this man. And, but guess what? Within a year, I'm, I'm getting straight A's. Uh, I graduate with honors out of high school. I start learning about business and investing. I speak three languages. I have multiple businesses that are successful. And I can honestly tell you, it was that whipping where he knocked the tar out of me that put me on that path of excellence because in the beginning it was fear and then it turned into a habit. And once I began to have the habits and rituals of excellence, like God teaches us, it put me on a whole new trajectory in life. That's interesting. And for, with, the, with the ranch, what what do you think was the reason? Like, why did everyone have such little food? You think on a ranch, you got all this land, you probably can grow stuff, you got cattle. Mm. Maybe you just look at, we could sell it. Like, was you just, you said that money was always an issue. Money worked was, really, really hard. Yeah. Did he have the ranch while your parents were married or was that afterwards? I could assume that they wouldn't be married if he worked like that. You know, it's like maybe 
maybe not what what your mom signed up for or maybe it was and she just didn't know 18 hours days is crazy well my family's from south dakota and south dakota rural south dakota is some of the hardest working human beings on on the face of the earth you got you know mild summers but the winters are brutal and the wind blows like 50 miles an hour and so working like incredibly hard is the way of life in that area for farmers and ranchers. I mean, it just, it is what it is. And that's what you're expected to do. Now, my mom and my dad got married, moved from South Dakota to Missouri, and they had no money. They, they bought this farm um, and they moved into the barn of that farm. Now, the barn had a dirt floor, uh, 10 walls, it had electricity, but it did not have heat or running water. And that's what my, when my mom was pregnant with me, that's where my mom, my dad, and my two brothers lived for the first winter. So it could be like five degrees outside, but they're in a tin barn with a dirt floor. Uh, and that's where they lived. And so it's literally the epitome of coming from absolutely nothing. And I believe that number one, uh, I'm receiving the rewards that my fa parents had worked their tail off for. And I'm receiving the awards that my God was sacrificed for. Like I am blessed because of the people who put in the work before me to get me to this point. And they signed up, you know, my dad was, my dad is always a hard man. My dad was raised by a World War II veteran. My granddad was the first wave Normandy Beach D-Day, original frogman. Uh, when they hit the beach, there was a 90% casualty rate. He raised my dad very, very tough. And my dad raised me very, very tough. But then my dad was also very, very tough on my mom. And so to answer your question, uh, my dad's been married three times. He's currently not with anybody. Uh, he just works so hard all the time. He just couldn't set the work aside to spend time with family and, and to build that family. And I, I feel so bad for him for that. But a lot of times I think we can learn what to do and what not to do by, by our parents. And I chose to choose what served me from my parents and put that into practice, but also chose to put into practice what they didn't do what the Bible says to do, and it's built the life that I have now. And um, that lifestyle, you know, your your livelihood is the land. It is the crops you grow. It is the livestock you raise. So, you know, chilling out and just, you know, having a lot of time for big, you know, meals and all this stuff, it just wasn't, it wasn't there for us. And it was literally me, my dad, my, my uh, two brothers, and a couple hired men. So it was all men. And back then was drinking, fighting, dirty magazines, and girls. That was really the only thing that I thought about at that time in my life. And I know it's like, that's crazy. You're 12. Yeah, well, I was. I mean, the first time I was uh, 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 introduced to any type of pornography or anything, I was six. And you know, the, the, looking back as a Christian, you know, man, as a, as an athlete, as a business owner, uh, I was like, man, the devil was trying to get me from a young age. And I'm so thankful that it didn't work out that way, but it was a wild kind of existence in the beginning. And, and God was in all of it. I can tell you that. Yeah. And, and throughout that, did you end up like, obviously you had, Hey, you can work on the farm or you can go and, and do well in school. Was there times where you teeter totter and you're like, man, this school stuff's kind of annoying. Like I'm going all in on the farm. Like, what was that like? Did you, what was some of the stuff that you did? How, how long did you work there? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of normal people say like get good grades or work on the farm. I was actually expected to do both. And so, um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's like when you live that ranch lifestyle, you're a plumber, you're a fencer, you're a horse trainer you're a veterinarian, you can fix a tractor, you can fix a truck, you can change a tire. Like as a ranch individual, you're expected to do everything all the time. And that's why yeah. my dad, you know, as I'm getting as a business owner now and our team grows and grows and grows, it's like, I can't do everything myself. Yeah. I firmly believe that with my father on the farm and a lot of business owners out there, they think the things to themselves, which are tricks of what I call the enemy, the devil. I, nobody can do it as, I, as good as I can. I have to do everything myself. Yep. Right. Um, every time I try to give somebody an opportunity, they ended up sticking me in the back with it. You know, um, they say things to themselves like, well, I can just do that myself faster. So I don't want to trust somebody else to do it. And so yeah, you end up I was going to ask you about that, too, is like that must have been difficult going from do it all yourself 
mm. never get your time out to like, as an example, right? Like my, my dad owned a flood restoration and carpet cleaning company, but similar mm. where it was like, oh, wow, look at you can make even more money if you do these couple jobs because now yeah. you don't have to pay someone to do it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What, that must have been difficult at first, learning it's, to let go of some of those things. It's still hard, man. I was counting up. We, we're at about 16 you know, employees per se on, on our businesses, and it's so hard for me to delegate. Like it's so hard. It just read into me like to, I call it GSD, get stuff done. Like, and I just, I really, I thoroughly enjoy working. Like I like to work. Um, you know, a lot of folks, they want to be done early and they, but like I'll work till, you know, five o'clock, six o'clock, spend a few hours with the kids, put the kids to bed, get them to bed at eight 30 and then work till 1230 or, or midnight or, and I, and my wife and I both do that consistently. So I enjoy working, but it is yep. the hardest thing I've ever had to do to be able to delegate, but then have great systems and processes in place paired with KPIs, key, key performance indicators that keep these people on track without me having to stand over them with my thumb on them all the time. It's the hardest thing I've ever done because systems and processes for a guy that just likes to go, 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 go. You think, oh, I'd waste all this time creating all these systems and then the systems don't work. And then I got to go redo the systems and I got to, and what I could tell the, 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 the small business owner, you know, small team guy is like have incredible systems. If you need to spend a week creating systems to replace yourself with somebody else, do it. If you need to spend two or three days, like putting together key performance indicators, like you need to hit this many numbers, you need this many sales or this many leads or whatever it is for your business, do it, create it, because that's what allows you to have the free time and go do other things. And I can honestly say in like, you know, our businesses, we have multiple businesses. Um, I'm ADD and dyslexic, by the way. I was in every learning disability class there is. I was made fun of all through school because I took one bath a week and kids could smell me and they didn't, you know, that was not cool. So what I'm basically what I'm saying, guys, if I can figure it out, you can figure it out. Was it also difficult going from so much physical labor is like the way to success? And now obviously you guys are manufacturing. You talked about your belts. You talk, you talked yeah. about and, and buckles. You talked about the kids clothing. These are e-commerce products that you're marketing online, maybe doing some trade shows and stuff, but that's not your, you know, it's not like you're doing 10 hours a day of trade shows and all this stuff. Was it difficult kind of going from this, you're successful by putting your head down, grinding with your hands to, hey, actually you don't, you, you know, you could get fat in this business. You know, you, you yeah. get, you get fat because you ain't, you're not doing anything, you know, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, was that a weird transition doing online compared to, always like everything being physical. So I'm a, I'm a funky guy, man. I'm, I'm a, I'm a weird guy. I like to get my hands dirty. I like to get in the mix. Um, interestingly enough, yes, it was incredibly hard because when you're used to doing everything yourself and you're a phys you do physical labor tasks, when you start to work mentally, it's a whole nother type of exhaustion. And yep. for years, when I hit like 32, 33, 34, somewhere in there, I started backing off, like doing all the physical labor things and started thinking more about, you know, mental toughness and, and learning new skills and all this stuff. And that's kind of when I was introduced to uh, one of Russell Brunson's ads and I got into the whole digital media thing. And that was five years ago. And there was a phase there where I went so far in that I just shut everything physical off. I'm like, yeah. I will figure out how to do this digital thing. And I'll, and if there's something physical that needs to get done, I'll hire it out and I'll stay focused on this. And then I found out that I was like, I'm not happy just sitting in an office all day. Yeah. And the last year or so I've been like really mixing it up. So I'm doing the physical labor, you know, one or two days a week, getting in with the guys, getting dirty, having fun. But then I'm also have my time for the office where I knock out, uh, and handle my team, whether it's running ads, building landing pages, email sequences, text sequences, all this stuff that I knew didn't even know existed. As a matter of fact, when I got them, I hated the people that created them. You know, in the past, now I'm the guy that sends that stuff out. So yes, it was incredibly difficult for me because I just like I liked getting outside and getting dirty. Um, now the great thing about for myself and other maybe people that are like me that are biz small business owners that provide a service once you get to that point 
the days that you don't have to go out are the days that you hated in the past anyway. The cold, wet, rainy, the freezing your fingers off, the sweating at 110 degrees. You can get to begin to pick and choose the days that you go out. And I'm very much an individual who, when I decide I want to do something, I go all in, like 100% until I got it figured out. And once I get it figured out, then I create systems, processes, and I delegate. So good, man. And when I when I'm looking at, I just did an event not too far from you. I think it even hugged the Brazos River. So you oh, were talking cool. about some of your properties that touched it. So I'm literally there, which is this is the craziest thing. I, I rented out Wildcat Ranch. So it's okay. just like I don't know, it's probably an hour from me, hour and a half. Mm-hmm. It's about 1,500 acres, and so I'm sitting there, and and they have like. You can, they do, we did tons of horseback riding and all this stuff. They have all these trails and that overlook the river, but I'm in the bar and there's an older guy had to have been like 80 and he's drinking a beer at the time. I didn't know what else he had ordered. So I'm just sitting there talking to him and, and he just like, it's jaw dropping to me normal, probably for most people, but I'm like, I'm from the West coast, San Diego. Yeah. We surfed, we rode motocross, we had RVs and campers. We never had pets outside of dogs and hamsters. Like. You just don't have that. So this guy's like old school accent. So I'm getting to know him. And he had, I think it was like 1,100 acres that bordered the other side of the river. And he was in oil and a bunch of other stuff and cattle and whatever else. So I'm like, I'm already buying everyone's food and drink at my whole event, right? So I'm just like, hey, just put these people's stuff on it because it's not even going to be noticeable. Yeah, Yeah, not even a blip. Like it was compared to them is very minimal. I get yep. his check. I found out he only ordered like four beers and it was like $16 total. It's yeah. like nothing. But this guy to me, like is kind of an epitome of like, this guy's like 80. He has, you know, probably a few thousand acres total. Just mm-hmm. a cool guy. And he literally was like upset. But then he like his eyes watered because I bought $16 worth of beer. Yeah. And I was just like, when was the last time? Probably he's taking care of everyone in his family. Like, when was the last time that someone bought him something or like did something for this guy? Because he's just probably that guy that's done everything. I just, I just think that there's something to that life that maybe you could speak into. Because I'd love to get in the into the rodeo stuff. But it's like, what stuff as an American, as a as a Christian man, that is biblically aligned, but also like as a man, just to help us be what men are created to be, made in the image of God. Yeah. That you've learned in your lifestyle and, and having land and, and doing this physical labor that you feel like is missing from like, let's say you go to these digital marketer events and you meet yeah. all the, all the dudes there. You're like, man, like if these guys would do these things and experience this, they would be completely different. Well, let me tell you, I think it's a, it's, it's about time we get back to basics. You know, you go back to Jesus as a day. Jesus was a carpenter. Uh, The majority of folks back then were traders of goods. They were sheep herders. They were essentially farmers. They tilled the land. They did the things. And that's how it was up until a couple of hundred years ago in the Industrial Revolution. 98% of Americans were actually farmers a couple hundred years ago. And so if anybody looks back on their family line, they are tied back to farmers and ranchers and people who worked and tilled and toiled the land. And so I believe that we need to go back to basics. As men, we're supposed to be leaders and providers of not just our families, but our communities. We're supposed to lift up, build up, push, motivate, inspire those people around us. And the way that you live your life should be such a light that other people see Christ living inside you. And what happens is we get distracted by the media. We see the news. We see what's going on on social. We see what's going on around the world. And we begin to believe the narrative that it's pushing at us. And my friends, the only narrative that you should believe is the one that says you are a light in Christ in the Bible. And if people would just go back to that, being service minded, not how much money I can make. You know, it's so interesting. I follow a lot of digital media experts. I've gotten to know some really uh, powerful players like yourself. Uh, I'm not going to throw names, but I know a lot of the guys now. I've been in for five years. And one of the things that a lot of marketers do is they talk about how much money they sold and, you know, or whatever. What if you were so service minded that the money just floods in? If you look at what I promote, what I push, what I do, it's never 
I tried the, hey, I made a hundred thousand, I made a million, or we had to be so service minded that everything else will serve it, come in. And that's when you're talking about ranchers, farmers, you realize that the suicide rate for a farmer and a rancher is double the highest suicide rate of any person in America. It's double. You know why that is? No it's because those farmers and those ranchers provide food. They provide schooling for their families. They provide food for the entire nation. And there's only 2% of the population that are farmers and ranchers. And guess what? They're, they're, they're dealing in commodities. So beef is up one week. Beef is down. Corn is up. Corn is down. Wheat is up. Wheat is down. And guess what? If you don't time the market just right and, and you're praying that there's rain, right, you could lose hundreds of thousands of dollars and your family ranch that is fifth generation, fourth generation, third generation could go belly up that fast. And so wow. for that guy that you're, you're, you bought those beers for, he's so used to serving other people, whether it's his community, what, with beef, whether it's his family, he's not used to being allowed to have somebody do something kind for him. And my dad's the prime example. My dad is that man. Exactly. Like I've seen my dad to teach somebody how to ride a horse, like spend hours and hours and hours and hours, and they don't have any money to pay him and he just do it anyway. All right. And so I think as business owners, if we just get obsessed with like, how can my service be incredible? How can my service be not just a little bit better than the competition, but be double or triple as good as the competition? If you get obsessed with that, they will come back to you time and time and time and time and time again. If you, you should not sell to somebody just because you can on a one-time offer, right? If, you're, if they're going through your funnel or if they're going through your business and they have the opportunity to buy something else, you should not sell them just because they're in a buying mood. Because if you do and you don't follow up with magnificent service, they're going to end up resenting you a week later, a day later. They're going to have remorse for buying that thing. And so I've been on both ends of the spectrum, two, three, you know, upsells, order bumps, all that, just get as much as you can. And I found out that when I got more into that, my service side didn't back up what I was selling. And I was selling just because I could, not because I was servicing a need that absolutely could fix the problem. And I noticed that in my businesses, and this has been a couple of years ago, that that just didn't work long term. And the answer is service, 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 service. You got to meet the customer where they're at and give them like exceptional service. There's a, in, in Proverbs 23, 4, it says, do not weary yourself with the overwhelming desire to gain wealth. Mm. Cease from your own understanding of it. When you set your eyes on wealth, it's suddenly gone. The wealth certainly makes itself like, uh, itself wings like an eagle and flies to the heavens. Ah. And I thought that, I, I talked to that with our guys just last week because the, the whole point was like, when you're just trying to get the end result that everyone else has, you try to take all these shortcuts. It's like, yep. hey, don't don't just focus on the wealth. Like if you're chasing just the wealth around, you're just always going to fall into like all these different traps rather than what's the focus that we want to have, right? And it's I, I think it fits with what you're talking about is, well, if you take a step back and you create something very, very good to solve a great problem and there's actually a reason – that people will exchange money for it that's that's more valuable i always love that term of like uh, ever my wife and i we pray uh for our stuff with king's brotherhood and i'm just like god bring yeah. me the people where their money is not worth it isn't as valuable to them as the transformation in their life mm -hmm. i like that money isn't worth it like they're like you know where they're like hey please take this away so i can have that because yeah. that is so much more valuable to me than, than what i have and that exchange is so powerful compared to like what you said, which is like, how do I get someone to give me, give me their money, even if they think it's more valuable, but kind of trick them into it, or you're just trying to hit like a certain goal. And it's, it's very, yeah. it's, it's fleeting, right? The Bible's true and get rich quick schemes and all these different things that people try to take. And it never, you never see them on the Forbes list or the, or the wealthiest families in the world for generations. That's for sure. And and I had to, as a business owner, you know, I'm, I'm a world champion, professional athlete. Uh, it wasn't always that it was a massive struggle. I've struggled with multiple addictions from pornography to suicide. I mean, I have really struggled. I quit drinking and quit chewing tobacco the day I won a world championship because I didn't want young men to see me with doing that kind of stuff. 
And I didn't want that to reflect God's kingdom because I got saved and I, I was serious about it. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm saved, kind of. I guess this is a real deal for me. And the thing about it is I had to learn how to enjoy it all circumstances. Paul talks about it in Corinthians. I, you know, I used to be happy if I was winning. I used to be happy if I made some money. I used to be happy if I, you know, was on TV or whatever. And at the end of the day, you know, we got as business owners, as men, as Christians, as leaders, we got to learn to be happy in all circumstances, whether you're well-fed, whether you're hungry, whether you're in prison or whether you're free. You have to learn to be happy and enjoy life, especially the love of Christ in all circumstances in life. And for me, yeah. I had to uh, get back to my basics and say, all right, I like getting dirty. I like being outside. I like leading people. Uh, I, I'm, I'm focused on service as well as I also need to have my email sequences locked in. I also yeah. need to have my tech sequences locked in. So I've found that for myself, I am happiest if I'm a well-rounded individual and not just all of one. Now, again, I'm ADD and dyslexic. I have an absorbent amount of energy that I just have to burn off. And I'm, I'm not happy doing one thing all day, every day. That's just not me. Um, so, but I would tell you on your own happiness and to chase that, as long as it aligns with the Bible, like get after it. Yeah, it's so good. And, you know, I, I love that people talk about in the garden, there's, all these different trees that God said were good to eat from. It's like, this is good. Go do these good things. And there was one that was like, don't do this. And, and, uh, and oftentimes, like you said, as long as your desire aligns with the Bible, God will direct you. But it's like, go do it. You know, go, yeah. go do it. The thing, if it's good in God's eyes. Uh, you talked about your encounter. I kind of want to touch on those two things. I don't know which order they go in. But it's like world champion and Christ mm -hmm. encounter. Because you talked about not growing up that way. I doubt that your dad led you to Christ. So it's like, yeah. what was that experience where you didn't just become a believer? Because even yeah. Satan believes in Jesus, you know? Yeah. It's not like okay. he's like, he doesn't exist. He's like, I believe in him too. Just uh, I just don't follow him and make him Lord of my life. So when was that experience for you? And when was that on the, on the journey to world champion? It's so interesting. God was with me the whole way, even when I was running from him for so long. You know, I, I like I said, I was introduced to pornography at six years old. and getting the girl and what girl you could sleep with and how cool you were was very popular to me when I was young. I mean, that's what I was raised in, brought up in. God is so funny because my dad uh, could quote scripture like no other, but did not live the way of, of, of the Lord. You know, it hasn't been until the last few years he's actually come back to the Lord, really, and he's in his 70s. So wow. that's pretty cool. Um, and that's a whole nother side tangent. Never give up on somebody because there's still time as long as they're breathing. Remember the man on the cross where said where Jesus looked at him and said that he said, forgive me. And he said, I'll see you today in paradise. So never forgive up anybody, your family, even if they're older. Um, the second thing is I was 27 when I got saved. That was a lot of years of wild party, uh, drinking, uh, flesh living, all of that stuff. And it's so funny. Uh, my mom was a praying mother, Bible-believing mother. Um, I thought she was one of those crazy Christians because we would go to, you know, like Bible retreats and, and certain things. We wouldn't even have money to eat on. Like, and we just leave town knowing that God would provide. And I just thought my mom was crazy, you know. And the times we did get money, had a little money, she would give it all away to TV preachers, This, which is why we went without food and why we don't, went without electricity is because she would give all the money she had to TV preachers, and then she would max out her credit cards, giving it away to TV preachers to where we literally didn't have money for anything. And so I ran from God. I was like, if, if, if I want to, you know, if I want to live like a Christian, that means I need to be poor, broke, hungry all the time, and believing in something that I can't even see. And so I thought Christians were just weak-minded. I thought, if, you know, if you're just tough-minded, you don't have to worry, believe in all this other mumbo-jumbo. But there was these uh, rodeo uh, Bible group slash um, ministry that went around to pro rodeo for like 20 years. And they would show up at all these rodeos and they'd feed like hundreds of cowboys and not ask for anything. And in my mind, I'm, I'm like dollars and cents. I'm like, well, somebody's paying these guys thousands of dollars to be here. So after a few years, they had given me a Bible. I'm like, I don't need that sucker. I'm going to throw it in my glove box. I shut it up. After a few years of watching them, 
I ask him, I say, hey, you know, I was like, how much you guys making be, do, showing up feeding all these people? You know, just a blunt kind of like business guy. And they're like, well, this committee is really nice because they gave us some free ice to give to you cowboys. I'm like, free ice? What are you talking about? What about the money? They're like, well, we just show up here and we believe God will provide all our needs to feed the hundreds of cowboys and their families and stuff. I'm like, what do you mean God will provide? They're like, well, we believe that the Holy Spirit guides our path and God will provide a way. I'm like, and as a non-Christian, that made no sense to me. I couldn't compute. I didn't understand. It's kind of like tithing. You know, you, you, you give, not expecting anything in return, but God blesses you abundantly when you tithe. I didn't get it. Didn't get it at all. Well, fast forward nine years, they had given me that Bible. It sat in a glove box in my truck. I cracked, the, I cracked the glove box on my truck. I start opening up reading it. I'm like, I'm just flipping through it. Hit the book of James. I'm like reading through James and I'm like, James 119, every man should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And that was the exact opposite of me. I'm redheaded, pale skin, hot tempered Irish guy. But I'm like, man, there's wisdom in this book. James 1, 5, uh, any man who lacks in wisdom, ask the Lord, for he gives freely without finding fault. But when you ask, you must not doubt. For a man who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. I'm like, boom, this Bible thing, there's a lot of knowledge in here. Some smart dude probably wrote this. And so I'm going through James, and I go through Proverbs, and I go through Psalms, and I just go through, go through it all. And I started to get that faith walk just just from a technical standpoint, like this is for good life. I don't really believe in Jesus or Holy Spirit and all that stuff. There's just a lot of good principles. Well, I meet my wife and dude, when I seen my wife, I was like, whoa, she is a fox. I'm going to marry her. She don't know what's coming, you know? And I, I finally, after 18 months, get her phone number. We start to talk like, excuse me, eight months, get her phone number. And we start to talk on the phone. We've messaged on Facebook back and forth, right? And she asked me, are you a Christian? And I lied to her face. I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. No big deal. Whatever I need to be, baby, to get you. I'm good. And through that time of us courting and getting to know, I kept reading the Bible. God entered my heart. The service of those ministries that went around feeding people for essentially free. Uh, I watched their life over a 10-year period and what they did. And between that, the Holy Spirit speaking through me me uh, through the Bible and my wife, like I got saved and I went all in. I went all in, but it's, it's interesting. And thanks for letting me talk. When I got saved, the next year was the hardest year of my entire life. The devil was on full blown attack mode. I, it was the only year I didn't qualify for the Super Bowl of our sport called the national finals rodeo my entire career. I was broke financially. I was trying to figure out how to be a husband trying to figure out how to, you know, provide for my wife and buy a place and have all this stuff. It's the hardest year of my life. So for any of you out there that are new Christians, when the enemy attacks, because trust me, he will stay hooked. Don't give up. Stay strong in your faith and he will flee. I promise you, he will flee if you stay strong in your faith. So then that kind of brings it all together is that you ended up getting married and saved right around, right around the same time. You got married just yeah. shortly after, it sounds like. Yep. How far were you in your career? And then what was like that? What was the difference in your career as well? Like, I'm assuming that you had a big influence and a shift on the people that were there. How did that shift? And, and were you still able to perform at a high level after getting saved? Because sometimes people think get saved, they, just, they don't have any desire to be excellent in the crafts that they have anymore. What was the, what was it like after that super hard year? So I had a lot of people that said I would never make it, that I was no good, that, you know, I wasn't good enough, wasn't strong enough, wasn't fast enough, you know, all this, all this stuff that people like to talk. I'm not going to throw anybody on the bus, but that fueled me to be the baddest athlete that I could possibly be. I worked harder. I went farther. I did extra things that nobody was willing to do because I just wanted the, I wanted the result. I wanted the win and I want to shut them guys up. I wanted to shut them up. So I just worked harder than everybody, than all the competition. I get saved, and all of a sudden, I'm like, my heart is transformed. And I didn't know how to be this mean, kind of rough, angry guy anymore because now I'm, I'm acting out of love instead of like, I'm going to show these SOBs, right? Now I'm acting in the love of God. And I went to God, I said, God, I said, I need you to give me strength. I need you 
to lift me up and teach me how to compete without anger in my heart because anger was always the motivation for me. And then I realized that God always said before somebody did something amazing in the Old Testament, I, uh, uh, the spirit of the Lord is with him, right? So Samson, Moses, all of these amazing characters in the Old Testament, the spirit of the Lord is with them. So I said, Lord, give me that spirit. Give me that spirit. Is love not stronger than hate? So I started competing out of love for the game. And I was one of the top ranked athletes in the world as a non-Christian who was angry. I went to world champion status year in and year out with the love of Christ in my heart. Because I was working out, I was training with love in my heart for the game, as well as knowing that the Spirit of the Lord is with me and is going to allow me to do amazing things, just like it did for David, just like it did for Moses, just like it did for Samson, Gideon, all of these warriors for Christ. That's what I wanted. And I truly accepted it. I thought, God, there is nothing that you can't do. And I leaned on one scripture, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for the spirit of the Lord does not make you timid, but gives you power, love, and a sound mind. And as an athlete and as a business owner, you must have a sound mind. How difficult was it uh, in a sport environment like that to gear up for like, let's say a world championship, you win, and then you go home and you're like back to regular life and you don't have that like, that thrill anymore and people in business can can oftentimes do it with like uh, if they're on an event side or if they have a busy season right it's like oh this is our season where we make the most money and then afterwards you're like try, you know you it, it's tough transitions and i know that you look at someone like um who's the the singer guy that like that died that uh, elvis presley you know like he mm. do these shows and even when he was drugged up like totally jacked, hated his life. He'd do the shows and he'd get all sweaty and excited, but then he'd have to go back to his hotel room afterwards. How did you yeah. deal with that? Or did you ever have any problems with that going from world champion to, you know, chilling, chilling at home? Well, to be honest with you, the year after I won the world championship was my most depressed year of my life. Um, Cause I worked, I, by the way, I was an old man by the time I won the world championship. Like I was 32. 32 first time world champion just doesn't really happen that often in my sport. Most of the world championships are won like 20 year olds, 23, 25, when your athletic peak is at the highest. And I went home and, you know, I was like, this is it, God? Like, I know I have the gold belt buckle that says world champion and I got all the TV and I got all the print ads and I got all the stuff, but like, I thought. Like my whole life would be fulfilled when getting this. And God made something very, very clear to me. Your life is not fulfilled by the things that you have or achieve, but the type of service that you give to others. And I had to flip it. I had to flip it in my head and say, it's not about trying to beat these guys or gain this gold buckle or to get a million dollars or to land the biggest endorsement deal. It's about doing it in service of others. So I wear a bright pink shirt every time. It's because I do it for breast cancer awareness, right? And people come up to me, Tyson, you helped my mother. Tyson, you helped my sister. Tyson, you helped my cousin. And they want to tell me their stories. And when I begin to tie it back in to service to others is why I compete, I then went on and reestablished a new why, and I got back to the height of things. So if you're an individual, maybe you made a million dollars. Maybe you got a half a million in your bank account, and you're doing amazing. Think about other people who rely on the service that you provide, whether that's an employee or that's a charity or that's uh, something else that you donate to. There's a lot more happiness that's based on your performance than you think. It's not about you. If you can tie it to service of others, you will stay hungry and stay motivated to go to the next level. And I will be clear. I have reestablished my purpose, my why over and over and over and over again. In the beginning, it was just to beat the other guys. Then it was for the love of my God. Still paired with the love of my God, then it was for my wife and my kids because I could never represent bad in front of my wife and my kids. Then after that, it's been charities, tra traffic children, 
breast cancer awareness, all these charities that I want to like literally make a dent in and make a difference with. And so you just have to reestablish that service to others. It could be called your why, but you must reestablish that service to others because that's initially what's going to keep you motivated. If you need a plane and a yacht and a boat and a lake house and a mountain house, that's cool. But when eventually you're going to get all that stuff and you're not going to be full inside. Service to others is what's going to allow you to live a fully true life. You guys have established businesses since. I know that you had mentioned to me maybe years ago how difficult even that transition was because it's just a one, it's momentum, it's neuro pathways, it's identity, whether you want it to be or not. You're like, you're a part of something. And then you're like, even going to the business world. You know, it's like me going, being a real estate investor all of a sudden. I go to a real estate groups and they, no one knows who I am. You know, it's like, yeah, start over who, who's this yeah. guy? What have you done? You're like, I've, you know, done something that you guys don't care about, basically. <laughs> so how much real estate you got? Like, uh, well, <laughs> not, not, not nearly as much as you guys. And so for None you, the, yeah. the businesses that you've created, um, walk through them as, as well as like that transition. Cause I feel that it's all the same, right? The transition from solopreneur to business owner or brick and mortar to online or a hybrid of them. It's always mm -hmm. this like evolution of you having to be okay with letting go of everything that makes you who you are. Like from the rancher that does everything to the, the guy who's world champion who now is going to go be a business owner because you, you can't, you know, probably can't be world champion in your sport for the whole, when you're 60. That's so now you're going to have to figure out. A new, yeah. 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 Well, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, I was going to say you can't do it now. You know, it's not like, you, you know, you old fart can go out there and do it now. Um, but, but that's, you know, that's changing a little bit. You know, there's Kelly Slaters of the world who surf well, and there's uh, people that do things at an old age, but still there's a place where there's just a transitionary period. What businesses Athletic. do you have going on right now? And, and how is that transition for you going from your main source of income being from, you know, doing your sport, yeah. which is a very solo thing, whether people yeah. say it's a team or not. It's like, well, you're just, all you have to do is grind, work, get better. You don't have to be a people person to like yep. be good at what you do. And in yeah, business you do. It, it's so interesting because for years I was kind of the one in front of the camera my wife's had an incredible music career and done done her thing as well, but I was kind of like the marketer, um, but she was the operator of the businesses. With our belt buckle pit business, before we had a, a great team behind us, she was the operator all the time. Um, with uh, Shea Baby, one of our uh, uh, baby product businesses, um, she is the operator. She's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of retailers nationwide we do online she is the operator of that now i'm more of like get in get your hands dirty i like the real estate i like ranch land uh, i've done things from you know uh online like mental toughness stuff to teaching people how to be cowboys to um you know real estate and land which has done very well here in texas for me over the last decade or so but it was freaking tough making that shift it was hard i you know, I, I didn't, it's not that I was not comfortable with starting over, but the one thing I learned is that you have to be comfortable being the low man on the totem pole again, if you're starting over in a new career. And those people that are, have ever been athletes, you know, when you leave football, when you leave basketball, if maybe it's high school, maybe it's college, maybe you even play professionally, you got to start over again. Now, the one thing I can tell you is whatever industry that you're in, whether it's real estate or athletics or online, there are people within your industry that are in the industry that you want to go into. For example, if you are in uh, you know, the events space, right? You like to throw events and you had you did a lot of events, I think, with your with your old stuff, right? The the billion dollar body stuff. Yep. There were people in that group that also were real estate investors. Correct. And what I did was like, okay, I'm a cowboy, but there's a lot of cowboys that are own ranches that own land. Now, whom can I find that's already in my core group of people that I can learn from, that I can not sponge off of, but just can time collapse off of? And I found a bunch of these old cowboys that I never asked the 
dime out of them. I never asked them for any money, but I was like, hey, I will do this, this, and this for you, but could you give me some advice on this? Can you give me knowledge? And they liked me because I was a hungry guy that was willing to do things that other people weren't willing to do. And it time collapsed my journey to make it, uh, to put you know this into reality. My first like eight or nine years in the real estate business, I was probably negative about $200,000. Like lots of mistakes, tons of like buying high, selling low, like everything that, you know, you're not supposed to do emotional buyer, like any and all the stuff that you're not supposed to do. That's what I did. And then I got around the Cowboys that had staying power and that were intelligent. And they taught me about handling my emotions and not doing things certain ways. And I, I built, you know, a, a multi, multi million dollar real estate portfolio in a very short time in the last 10 years based off that knowledge. So starting over is hard, but find somebody in your core group that you can time collapse based on their knowledge. Cause these people are willing to help out if you seek the right knowledge. What's so crazy is that wildcat are going there. I've kind of asked who usually comes to these like ranches. It's basically like has a great view pool. So kind of yeah. nice upscale commodities, a very nice hotel is better than I thought. Like they have their own restaurant and it's like cabin or hotel style. But then you have all these activities. You could shoot guns. You can go horseback riding. Kind of That's like cool. that, like a little bit of a Western experience. But since this has become so common, especially with Yellowstone and things like that, yep. the TV show coming out, literally it's like all foreigners. So like yeah. their whole cool. place, no one was speaking like with English. A, a, an American accent for sure. It was like people from the UK that are like, we want the full experience. We want to go out there. We want to go in the jeeps and go on tours and we want to go horseback riding and we want to shoot guns and i was like oh my goodness this is crazy like they're <laughs> getting wind of that well what's it's just wild that there's also that timing side of it you know it's like austin when i came here uh, i read the scripture actually in psalms it said the righteous possess land and mm. i decided to buy 30 acres so right cool. before it tripled That's so here awesome. in austin and That's it was so awesome. it was it was a serendipitous, like not very good, you know, it was just literally listening, God, what do you want us to buy? And he, you say the righteous possess land. What should we buy? I thought it was going to be a lifetime thing. And he was yeah. just like, this is this. Well, we just felt this is the one. So we buy it. Or, what do you have for us? And then 11 months later, we sold it for three times what we oh. put into it. And we were yeah. like, what is going on here? But um, you're, you were talking about your idea of doing that. I was like, oh, my goodness, like literally it's just the timing, you know, like it wouldn't be cool a hundred years ago to be like, you want to know what it's like to work hard and like ride a horse. Yeah. Everyone's like, no, I want to get in the car, bro. <laughs> That's yeah, what I want yeah. to do. Um, yeah, but just me. that, yeah, that timing's interesting. And so you, you had talked to me a little bit about that. You had some ideas or something you're doing. I don't know if you can talk about it live with everyone, but it yeah. Pretty so cool. I, when I began to, get on social media probably heavily about a decade ago. I started like utilizing social media uh, to be who I truly am. And that's a motivational type of dude that uplifts, that pushes, that inspires folks. Sometimes I'm going to be very blunt and I'm going to call you out on your BS that you're lying to yourself because I expect more out of you than that. So sometimes I have a mixture of things I do on social media. But I realized many years ago that I could use social media to lift, motivate, push, and inspire folks. And I just have felt a service to my fellow man to lift them up, to build them, because I was pretty much talked down to all the time as a young man, right? There was not like, hey, man, you can do it. I believe in you. It was mostly only, you're never going to make it. You're dumb as a box of rocks, you know, whatever. That was just how it was on the ranch that I grew up on. And it was just a bunch of manly dudes being like incredibly manly. And so for me, now that uh, I have the real estate, I have the things uh, that I'm doing, I'm able to go out and invest in properties that I think can spread the Western influence. And so what I've been doing is I've been trying to buy tracks of land and I'm creating a thing I call uh, equine on the Brazos. It's really close to the Brazos River, almost borders one of my other ranches. It's going to be a place, uh, the, the latest development that I'm doing is going to be a place where you can board your horse, where you can learn to ride a horse, where you can learn how to rope, where you can learn how to be a cowboy. And then I'm going to take it online too. 
So the people that are there in person, that board there, that stay there, they get the ability to be able to, you know, leverage the in-person instructors. And then the folks that maybe are out of state or out of country that want to learn as well, they're going to be able to hop online and get all the same lessons that were taught by the instructors, by myself, uh, and be able to apply that in their life where they're at as well. That's awesome, man. I, again, I think it's that time where people are searching for that again. Yeah. And, and just also it's a, before, if you were to have a horse and not a car, it's probably more of a poor thing. Now, if you have a horse, you're the rich person because only rich <laughs> people got horses, right? Like people, poor people, no poor people got horses unless you're like in the middle of nowhere. It just doesn't happen. It's very interesting how things flip, right? It's like, uh, yeah, horses are no it's, joke. That's I'm so going to use that in a motivational thing. A hundred years ago, <laughs> you were poor if you oh, had yeah. a horse and didn't have a car, and now you're rich if you have a horse. <laughs> oh, hundred percent, man. <laughs> Only that's... rich people nowadays have horses. It's it's no joke. <laughs> it's but not it's true though. Joke. That's part of the boundary I want to break down. Is like anybody can live the Western lifestyle. Like I'm going to go on a rant. Is it cool? Is it cool if I go on a rant? Yeah, go like, for it. Anybody can live the Western lifestyle. To me, being a cowboy is looking somebody in the eye, firm handshake, a man of your word, willing to get out and do things that others aren't willing to do because, trust me, manhood is crumbling in our country and in the world, to be honest with you. If you want to consider yourself a cowboy, you don't have to have thousands of acres of land. You don't have to have a 100 head of horses. You just have to have the desire to get out and be an upstanding human being that says, hey, this is the way I'm going to live my life. These are the, the values that I have imply, implemented in my family, implemented in myself, implemented in my ranch, my land, my apartment, whatever it is that you have. And you actually have a backbone. You have a backbone. If you know something's not right in the school system, talk about it. Work it out. If you know something's not right and there's injustice and it's happening, talk about it. Work it out. Being a cowboy is standing up for what you believe in. It's not just tilling the land. And I believe that anybody, anybody can be a cowboy. Anybody can have those cowboy ethics, those cowboy principles. It's just that society likes to take the easy way out. As a cowboy, I'm not willing to do that. And I know that people who own businesses, they know how hard it is to keep that business. They know how hard it is to work. So keep those same ethics. Be a cowboy. Yeah. And we need more cowboys. If we had more of them, man, I can't. The amount of people that self-sabotage in this world, men, just because they can't do what you said, firm handshake, stand up for what you believe in, follow through on what you say. It's like, dude, you're the reason you're not where you want to be is literally because you're just running out the back door on everything that you've ever tried to do. You can't, you can't keep a commitment to yourself or any other people. It's why I just want, I mean, we reach so many guys, right? So it's like, yep. when you, when you have enough of them message you and you go, Hey man, here, here's some, uh, here's some info, go do this. And then they fly out They're They're out there doing something else the next week. And you're like, man, it's just self-sabotage. It's crazy. It, it's because 50% of the houses in America don't have a father. That's part yeah. of it. And then the other part 100%. of it is that people have been conditioned to think that hard means stop hard does not mean stop hard mean get your ass in gear and keep going because i've never met anybody who's a multimillionaire and came from nothing somebody who's mentally tough somebody that's resilient somebody that's strong that had it easy all the time easy is the enemy you have to approach hard as if that's just an obstacle that i'm going to overcome because i'm called by god to go do this thing and i will get it done with yep. every beat of my heart and that's, that's the thing that I see. And I'm with you, bro. Freaking messages on Instagram and Facebook and all this stuff. It's, I would do that, but it's hard. Well, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed yeah. to be hard. Like nothing in the Bible for any of these legendary folks that we read about that we are, know are amazing, amazing men of God was easy. God showed up yeah. in the last moment, in the last second, when all hell was breaking loose. That's when God shows up in your life. So expect to be happy when it's hard. I think it's Paul who says is consider it pure joy when perseverance happens or bad thing happen because it, it's actually consider it pure joy when, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher go this. Go through various trials. 
Yes, consider it pure joy when you go through various trials because it creates perseverance. And yeah. perseverance is what's needed. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just went through this myself. Sean Cannell, he's amazing on YouTube. So amazing. I, I, was, I told him, I said, dude, YouTube's really hard because I've kind oh, of started amazing, stopped yeah. YouTube a million times. And you know what he said? It was so good. That is exactly what you're saying, but it's just a different context. He said, yeah, it is for everyone. Which is the point. If you can be the one who does it, then because there's so many people that watch YouTube, there's so many less content creators because it's so hard. And mm. it just clicked for me and I was like, Oh, like I can do it. Like they're they're quitters, but I could do it if I really wanted to. And he was just and it just motivated me knowing that most people won't. Yeah. Like, oh, most people won't because it's hard for everyone. And the same with the business stuff. I, yeah. I the amount of people that reach out and are just like man, the business stuff is so hard right now. And I'm just like, yeah, it is. It's always going to be hard for everyone. And so like, what are we going to do? You know, and, and the YouTube thing inspired me. I've been consistent with it, but it's still even my worst platform. But I'm just like, I know that if you quit, you lose. And it's hard for everyone. So if it's going to be hard for everyone, I'm going to be the guy who does it because there's only going to be few standing at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's that exactly what you're saying as well. That consistency is the differentiating factor. It's what gives you the ability to stand out. Yes, I, I know YouTube's hard. Yes, I knew social media is hard. But if you continuously post time and time and time and time again and say, well, this worked, this didn't work, and then make yep. a little adjustment and do that so not only with your social media, but your life. Whoa, I said this to my wife. That didn't work. I'm going to self-adjust real quick and never say that again. And that's the, that's the way it works. You just reflect and stay consistent, stay hooked. In the cowboy industry, we say stay hooked, stay hooked. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't quit. Keep going. Do what Winston Churchill says. Never, never, never give up. Never give in. Keep moving forward. Just learn from the things that you need to learn from and adjust and then go again over and over and over and over again. I always tell the people that I train uh, with the mental toughness, I talk to them, I say, you got to learn to reward the effort, not the outcome. We're so, this post got 10,000 likes. Oh, that's so great. And then you're chasing 10,000 likes and not living your truest version of yourself. Yeah. Reward the effort, not the outcome. Because it's not all about likes. It's not about championships. You know, you see guys like myself or other athletes, you say world champion, right? It's, you think that world champion, like I was working towards being world champion all the time and I was, but you know how I got that? I worked on one move thousands of times over, and then I got that mastered. Then I moved to another movement, and I worked on that thousands of times until I got it. And then I went to another movement and worked on that thousands of times, and then I got it. And eventually, I would worked on so many movements that it cr created a collection of, of a, a ride and rodeo, and it resulted in a championship. But I wasn't focused on the championship. I was focused on one step at a time over and over and over thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of reps i just kept going and then i got the outcome same thing with you and your business same thing with social media same thing with learning any new skill the difference is you got to be okay with it you got to be okay with putting in those thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of reps without the outcome and how you do it is you reward the effort yes i put in the effort today not the outcome and the outcome will always be fleeting no matter what it is. If you go, I want likes, you'll get likes and you'll go, well, I got not enough comments. And then you go <laughs> comments and you go, I didn't get enough followers. And then you get followers and they didn't buy anything. And you're like, yeah. well, I, I don't want followers. I want buyers. And you get buyers and you're like, well, I want repeat buyers. I need predictable buyers. And it's just like, just because like I, I'm going through it, right? Doing the social thing. We just had a post that got 70,000 likes and like awesome. some 30,000 comments or something. And this was last week. And I, I was like, oh, like the follower conversion wasn't that great. So yeah. like, what was the point of the, the like thing? And then, you know, so it's either you start, you just start chasing the wrong things. And really I'm like, you know, we'll learn from it. And, hey, people like this kind of content. That's cool. That's something to take a note on. But at the end of the day, it's like, you have to have that chasing those things or not. You're going to have a bad week and you're not going to have good likes. Like I have yeah. this all the time, you know, it's like, Times yeah. where just content just doesn't do it and people don't, people don't like it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I can complain that I'm shadow banned all day because I post scripture, but really it's like they probably just, people just don't like my posts. It's just how it is. But I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you coming on here and 
and us being able to jump in a bunch of different directions from faith and scripture to manhood to, you yeah. know, we went, we went all over the place, but I appreciate you doing that. I would love for people to get more connected to you as well as, you know, a lot of the products that you sell are things that typically people need in general. Right. And it's like, I think yeah. people getting connected with some of that, the best way to do it is through getting connected to you. That's awesome. But how can they best connect with you or some of the businesses that you run? Yeah. I mean, simplest, easiest way is just check out my Instagram, check, depend on what platform you like, check out my Instagram or my Facebook, uh, YouTube, that kind of stuff. Uh, my main goal is to serve. And if I can serve and motivate and inspire and push, I always know that the, the money is always on the back end of service. And so if I can, you know, communicate with y'all on Instagram or Facebook, hit me up there. I answer every single message on Instagram and Facebook, every single one of them. And so don't think that just because you see a number on those platforms that I'm not personally invested in trying to help every person I can, I am. That's probably the best place to connect with me. Awesome, man. So Instagram.com slash Tyson Durfee for those people that are wondering. Uh, T-Y-S-O-N-D-U-R-F-E-Y. Yep. Awesome, man. Thanks so much again. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been fun.